Hello, my name is Chris Winters. I am professor and chair of LSU Urology in New Orleans. Additionally, I'm a member of the AUA Update Editorial Board. This AUA Update, Lesson 33, a critical appraisal of the 2021 AUA SUFU Guideline on Adult Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction, reviews the latest clinical guidelines and places them into clinical context. I chose this lesson mainly to facilitate the incorporation of the most current guideline principles into our clinical practices. This lesson does so by reviewing the risk stratification and appropriate evaluation of patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract disorders. In addition, this lesson also provides updates on surveillance recommendations and lastly, it provides updates on non-surgical and surgical treatment options. I hope you find this lesson as useful for your clinical practices as I have. For more information on the AUA Update series or to subscribe to receive the full compilation of all 40 lessons, please visit the AUA University at auanet.org forward slash university. AUA Update Series, Volume 42, Lesson 33, A Critical Appraisal of the 2021 AUA SUFU Guideline on Adult Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction. Authors, Noah Friedland, M.D., Scott Durham, B.S., Eric Lee, M.D., Jenny Guo, M.D., and Stephanie Kielb, M.D. Introduction Urologists frequently manage patients with a range of neurologic comorbidities that impact the urinary system. Some of these conditions, such as spinal cord injury or spina bifida, can have obvious and devastating impacts on proper lower urinary tract function and renal health. Other more common conditions, such as diabetes and cerebrovascular accident, can result in difficult-to-manage urinary symptoms that significantly impact patient quality of life. The most common causes of neurologic insults resulting in urinary symptoms are cerebrovascular accident and diabetes. It is estimated that more than 795,000 people in the United States experience stroke each year, with 40 to 60% of those patients developing urinary incontinence in an acute setting, and up to 15% with persistent incontinence at one year. The most common spinal cord insults are multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury. A recent study has estimated that there may be close to 1 million adults living with multiple sclerosis in the United States and more than half of patients with multiple sclerosis will have lower urinary tract symptoms. Lastly, the incidence of spinal cord injury is thought to be around 17,730 cases yearly in the United States, with a prevalence of around 290,000. In 2021, the AUA and the Society of Urodynamics, Female Pelvic Medicine, and Urogenital Reconstruction, SUFU, published the first Joint Society Guidelines for the Management of Adult Patients with Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction. These guidelines emphasized that conditions previously under the umbrella of neurogenic bladder often affect additional elements of the lower urinary tract, bladder neck, and or its sphincters by adopting the broader term neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. In this update, we provide a condensed review of the 2021 AUA SUFU Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction Guideline Statements. We have sought to highlight guideline statements that would be of the greatest clinical value to the general urologist, with a focus on the importance of proper surveillance, the judicious use of urodynamics, and appropriate medical and or surgical management. Initial Evaluation the initial evaluation of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction is crucial for establishing the appropriate treatment plan for patients and determining their level of risk. Risk stratification is performed to identify a given patient's potential to develop upper tract damage. The wide range of etiologies and variable patient presentations of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction present a significant clinical challenge, and thoughtful initial workup is essential. Per guideline statements, the initial evaluation should include a post-void residual in addition to detailed history, physical, and urinalysis. However, cystoscopy is not routinely recommended. The use of voiding, catheterization diaries, pad tests, and non-invasive uroflowmetry is optional at the initial visit. Upper tract imaging or urodynamics at initial evaluation is contingent upon the patient's risk stratification. Notably low-risk patients should not routinely receive upper tract imaging or urodynamics in this setting. Risk stratification. 
The guidelines stratify neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction based upon the patient's risk of upper tract damage. In the setting of acute neurologic insults resulting in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, clinicians should wait for the condition to stabilize before performing risk stratification. After the initial evaluation, the patient is classified as either low risk or unknown risk. Unknown risk patients can ultimately be stratified to low, moderate, or high risk depending on neurodynamics findings, post-void residual measurements, upper tract imaging, and renal function evaluation. Unknown risk patients are reclassified as moderate risk if urodynamics demonstrates bladder outlet obstruction or detrusor overactivity with incomplete bladder emptying, or if the patient is known to have elevated post-void residuals. Features of the initial evaluation that should qualify a patient as high risk include urodynamics demonstrating poor bladder compliance, high detrusor storage pressures, detrusor external sphincter dyssynergia, or vesicourethral reflux, upper tract imaging showing hydronephrosis, new scarring, parenchymal loss, or significant stone burden including staghorn stones, abnormal or unstable renal function. In the absence of moderate, high-risk urodynamics findings, with normal upper tract imaging and renal function, patients are classified as low-risk. Certain pre-existing factors prompt additional evaluation even in patients who are otherwise considered low-risk, including recurrent urinary tract infections, history of stones, and elevated post-void residuals. While the guidelines do not define a specific post-void residual volume as elevated, a post-void residual is considered concerning if it could be associated with a clinically relevant abnormality or condition. This is an understandably broad definition given the complexity of urinary abnormalities in patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. We feel that post-void residuals should be trended across multiple clinical encounters, and concern is warranted when there is evidence of potential impacts to the upper tracts, worsening renal function, hydronephrosis, pyelonephritis, or high bladder pressures on urodynamics. Location of neurologic insult and patient risk. A wide range of neurologic insults can result in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, each with varying degrees of severity and risk of potential upper tract damage. The guidelines have included consideration of specific locations of neurologic injury in their stratification process. Suprapontine insults, cerebrovascular accident, brain tumor, traumatic brain injury, are considered low risk in the absence of other moderate high-risk features. Such insults are deemed low risk because patients with these injuries usually experience detrusor overactivity while maintaining synergistic voiding, which is protective of the upper tracts. Peripheral insults distal to the spinal cord, such as herniated discs, nerve damage from prior pelvic surgery, and diabetic neuropathy, can also result in low-risk neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. Patients in this population usually have low bladder storage pressure, sparing the upper tracts. However, these patients can experience elevated post-void residual secondary to poor bladder contractility, resulting in a loss of bladder compliance over time. If a patient in this population develops poor compliance, they may transition from low risk to high risk. Additionally, patients with suprapontine insults may develop elevated post-void residuals, which reclassifies the patient as moderate risk. The frequent reclassification of patients as their condition evolves demonstrates the complexity of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction and underscores the importance of thorough initial evaluations and diligent re-evaluations. The guidelines emphasize that neurologic insults resulting in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction put patients at higher risk of upper tract damage if they are associated with detrusor overactivity and detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Suprasacral spinal injuries like multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, and spinal cord injuries carry a greater risk of upper tract damage in the presence of adverse features. Thus, patients in this population are considered unknown risk pending further evaluation to determine their appropriate classification and recommended surveillance protocol. Surveillance of Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction Based Upon Risk The frequency and intensity of surveillance is based on initial risk stratification. Low-risk patients require no surveillance but should be re-evaluated if they experience any changes in symptoms or develop new complications associated with their neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, urinary tract infections, stones, deterioration in renal function, or rising post-void residuals. Moderate and high-risk patients require surveillance through comprehensive history, targeted physical examinations, symptom evaluations annually, and evaluation of renal function annually. Both groups should undergo upper tract imaging, with moderate-risk individuals imaged annually or biannually and high-risk patients imaged annually.
Both groups should undergo urodynamics if they have significant changes in symptoms, new complications, autonomic dysreflexia, urinary tract infections, stones, or worsening renal function. The following are some special considerations and highlights for surveillance strategy. 1. Patients with new signs or symptoms. Patients should be counseled to monitor for symptoms that may be indicative of worsening bladder function, such as new or worsening autonomic dysreflexia or signs of infection. Clinicians should monitor for stones or signs of upper urinary tract or renal deterioration. An emphasis is placed on workup of new clinical signs or symptoms, as symptomatic neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients are far more likely to have pathologic findings and benefit from an intervention than those without symptoms. After repeat workup, risk categorization should be updated with appropriate follow-up according to the new category. 2. Renal monitoring for spinal cord injury patients. Patients with spinal cord injury have significantly lower serum creatinine values compared to ambulatory individuals. Any significant rise in serum creatinine from baseline, even if in the normal range, should prompt assessment. Cystatin C may also be considered for better estimation of renal function if available. 3. Stone formation for spinal cord injury patients. Spinal cord injury patients are at increased risk for recurrent renal and bladder stones, requiring lifelong stone surveillance and regular upper tract imaging given low mobility states and increased urinary calcium. 4. Repeat urodynamics. Patients with high-risk neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction should receive urodynamics periodically. However, timing of repeat urodynamics is left up to the discretion of the urologic provider due to the heterogeneity in etiologies of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction and variability in the degree to which neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction evolves over time. Significant changes in symptoms should prompt consideration of urodynamics. 5. Gross hematuria. Painless gross hematuria, even in the presence of catheterization, should be worked up with upper tract imaging, ideally CT triphasic and cystoscopy. Neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients have a slightly elevated risk of bladder cancer, particularly squamous cell carcinoma in patients managed with indwelling foleys. However, routine surveillance in the absence of gross hematuria is not recommended as the absolute risk of bladder cancer remains low at 0.3% among patients with indwelling catheters. 6. Indwelling catheters and clean intermittent catheterization. Those who perform clean intermittent catheterization or use indwelling catheters are in the moderate or high-risk category and should be followed accordingly. No routine cystoscopic surveillance for bladder cancer is recommended, although cystoscopy is recommended for hematuria, recurrent urinary tract infections, suspected urethral stricture or false passage, or history of bladder cancer. Autonomic dysreflexia. The 2021 Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction Guidelines have multiple statements concerning the prevention and management of autonomic dysreflexia. The patients at greatest risk for autonomic dysreflexia are those with spinal cord injury at the cervical or upper thoracic, above T6 spinal level. In brief, autonomic dysreflexia is the result of uninhibited sympathetic activity below the level of the spinal cord injury in response to noxious stimuli, such as bladder filling or bowel distension. This sympathetic surge can result in life-threatening hypertension, compensatory bradycardia, and a parasympathetic reflex above the level of the injury. Bladder distension is thought to be the leading cause of autonomic dysreflexia in patients with spinal cord injury. Given this, the guidelines state that patients at risk for autonomic dysreflexia should be hemodynamically monitored during urodynamics or cystoscopy. The senior author on this update, Stephanie Kielb, educates nursing staff and patients to identify initial signs and symptoms. The first indication of autonomic dysreflexia will prompt immediate blood pressure measurement and result in termination of the study and immediate bladder drainage if elevated. Measuring blood pressure during urodynamics may provide an opportunity to educate patients on the importance of minimizing autonomic dysreflexia risk at home. If a patient develops autonomic dysreflexia, the guidelines direct clinicians in appropriate management described below. 1. If autonomic dysreflexia develops during urodynamics or cystoscopic procedures, terminate the study and immediately drain the bladder while continuing hemodynamic monitoring. In addition to draining the bladder, patients should be positioned upright, and tight clothing and constriction devices should also be loosened. Blood pressure should be measured at least every five minutes until return to baseline. 2. If autonomic dysreflexia persists despite bladder drainage, pharmacologic management and or escalation of care should be pursued.
patients are considered inadequately managed if systolic blood pressure remains greater than 150 millimeters of mercury or 20 millimeters of mercury above baseline and the patient is symptomatic. First-line treatment is topical application of 1 to 2 inches of 2% nitro paste above the level of the lesion. Nitro paste is preferred as it can be rapidly reversed by wiping it away should pressures bottom out. If nitro paste is unavailable, sublingual nifedipine may be used. If initial pharmacologic management is unsuccessful, then transfer to an intensive care setting may be necessary for administration of intravenous nitroprusside. Non-surgical treatment for neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. The 2021 Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction Guidelines recommend a variety of non-surgical treatments to address urinary symptoms and or protect the upper tracts. Conservative therapies, including pelvic floor muscle training, can be offered to neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients, specifically those with multiple sclerosis or history of cerebrovascular accident for symptom management. Pelvic floor muscle training is a non-invasive option primarily studied in the form of pelvic floor exercises to improve pelvic floor muscle strength. Several randomized controlled trials with small sample sizes have shown decreased lower urinary tract symptoms, fewer incontinence episodes, and improved quality of life with pelvic floor muscle training in the multiple sclerosis and post-cerebrovascular accident populations. Given the non-invasive nature of pelvic floor muscle training with low risk and potential benefit, the AUA SUFU recommends pelvic floor muscle training to all appropriately selected neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients. For symptoms of overactive bladder, Clinicians may recommend oral medications, including antimuscarinics and beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonists, or a combination of the two. Antimuscarinics have been shown to increase maximum bladder capacity and compliance, while decreasing detrusor pressures, frequency, and incontinence episodes. Similar effects have been seen with beta-3 adrenergic agonists, albeit in less robust studies. While adverse effects are generally minor for both classes of medication, there is evidence that anticholinergics may confer potential risk of dementia and cognitive decline, which should be discussed with patients prior to initiation of therapy. The guidelines panel abstained from giving specific medication recommendations given the lack of evidence of superiority of one particular oral drug. Intravesical forms of oxybutynin have been studied in limited capacity with similar benefits to oral versions and fewer systemic side effects. For patients currently on clean intermittent catheterization, this is a potential additional treatment option. If overactive symptoms are refractory to oral medications, intravesical onobotulinum toxin A may offer symptom improvement. There is grade A evidence suggesting that onobotulinum toxin A can improve storage parameters, decrease episodes of incontinence, and improve quality of life in the spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis populations based on systematic reviews. For other etiologies of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, onobotulinum toxin A still may improve these parameters. However, evidence is weaker, and the recommendation is conditional. Studies investigating optimal dosage have not shown differences in 200-unit versus 300-unit doses. The guidelines do not recommend specific injection dosages, locations, or frequency of injections. Risks of intravesical onobotulinum toxin A therapy, including urinary retention and need for clean intermittent catheterization, should be discussed prior to initiating treatment. The guidelines allow for the use of alpha blockers, which may improve voiding parameters in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients capable of spontaneously voiding. Studies have shown that combination therapy with anti-muscarinics beta-3 agonists and alpha blockers can potentially decrease post-void residuals and maximum urethral pressures and improve flow rate and compliance. A variety of medications, including tamsulosin, terazosin, doxazosin, and phenoxybenzamine have been studied in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction populations, particularly spinal cord injury and Parkinson's disease, but the guidelines do not recommend any one particular medication. Catheterization is a fundamental non-surgical treatment option offered to neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients. The 2021 guidelines strongly recommend clean intermittent catheterization over indwelling catheterization as a first-line option for this patient population. Clean intermittent catheterization lowers risk of urinary tract infection and improves quality of life compared to indwelling catheterization. However, if a patient is unable to perform clean intermittent catheterization, suprapubic indwelling catheterization is recommended over urethral catheterization to minimize urethral trauma. This recommendation was made based on limited observational studies, and there are currently no high-quality studies comparing suprapubic versus transurethral catheters. Several types of medication may be used to mitigate the risk of urinary tract infection with catheterization, 
including oral antibiotics and intravesical bladder installations. There are limited studies investigating intravesical installations, such as gentamicin, normal saline, acetic acid, or neomycin polymyxin, and evidence showing benefit in preventing urinary tract infection is minimal. Given the lack of evidence supporting usage of intravesical bladder installations, AUA SUFU recommends usage as an expert opinion, with no recommendation on types of installation, duration, or method of installation. The use of prophylactic oral antibiotics is addressed later in this AUA update. Surgical Treatment for Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction The guidelines address a myriad of surgical options for the treatment of bothersome symptoms of neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction and to prevent upper tract damage when medical management has failed. There is a wide range in the quality of evidence supporting different surgical options, and the guideline statements vary in strength of recommendations accordingly. Options permitted for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence include urethral bulking agents, slings, artificial urinary sphincters, and bladder neck closure in select patients with refractory symptoms. Urodynamics should be performed prior to any surgical treatment for stress urinary incontinence that may impact bladder compliance and storage pressures. The use of bulking agents for stress urinary incontinence is given a conditional recommendation, as there is minimal evidence in this patient population, success rates are low, and cure is rare. If patients with bothersome stress urinary incontinence have acceptable bladder storage parameters, the guidelines state that clinicians should offer slings to patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction based on a large meta-analysis demonstrating improvements in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients. Synthetic slings are not recommended in patients who may require clean intermittent catheterization in the future. Artificial urinary sphincters are a potential option for select patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. Before placement of artificial urinary sphincters in patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, consideration must be given to the potential need for future clean intermittent catheterization and worsening voiding dysfunction. Urodynamics confirmation of acceptable storage pressures is essential before placement of artificial urinary sphincters in the neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction population. The guidelines panel noted that the literature for artificial urinary sphincters in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction was limited by a heterogeneous patient population and small sample sizes. Clean intermittent catheterization is possible in patients with artificial urinary sphincters, but there may be a higher risk of erosion. Bladder neck closure remains an irreversible option in select neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients with outlet incontinence after diligent workup to ensure safe storage pressures. In men, counseling on the need for assisted reproduction after bladder neck closure should be performed prior to the procedure. The guidelines allow for both posterior tibial nerve stimulation and sacral nerve modulation as options that clinicians may offer select neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients with urgency-predominant symptoms. Both modalities are given a conditional recommendation. Systematic reviews of posterior tibial nerve stimulation in the neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction population suggest the benefits may be most pronounced in patients with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and cerebrovascular accident. No optimal stimulation schedule has been identified. Similarly, sacral nerve modulation has been shown to be most promising in patients with multiple sclerosis, cerebrovascular accident, and Parkinson's disease. However, loss of efficacy may be a problem in patients with progressive neurologic disease, such as multiple sclerosis. The guidelines explicitly recommend against the use of sacral nerve modulation in patients with spinal cord injury or spina bifida due to the high variability in the degree of bladder dysfunction in this patient population. Neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients with persistent adverse bladder parameters may require substantial surgical intervention to protect their upper tracts. Interventions covered by the guidelines include sphincterotomy, augmentation cystoplasty, continent catheterizable channels, and iliovesicostomy. Per guideline statements, sphincterotomy may be offered to select male patients unwilling or unable to undergo clean intermittent catheterization as long as they are counseled about the risk of failure and need for additional treatment. Augmentation cystoplasty may be performed to ameliorate adverse bladder parameters that are refractory to medications or onobotulinum toxin A and is associated with protection of renal function and improvements in continence. Prior to augmentation cystoplasty, patients should be counseled on long-term risks including stones, perforation, bowel issues, and mucus management. Per guideline statements, patients may be offered a continent catheterizable channel if they are capable of self-catheterizing, even if patient preference is the only indication. No specific recommendation is given as to preferred type of channel.
If patients are unable to perform self-catheterization, ileovesicostomy may be offered with a conditional recommendation by the guidelines panel due to limited evidence available. In the senior author's experience, ileovesicostomy results in poor drainage and mucus retention and often ends in repeat surgery and revision to ileal conduit. Conversely, the guidelines state that urinary diversion should be offered to patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction when other options have failed. Moderate recommendation. Cystectomy should be considered at the time of diversion given the subsequent need for cystectomy in up to 50% of diverted patients with intact bladders due to delayed complications such as pyocystis. After surgical treatments for neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, meticulous surveillance is required. The guidelines recommend repeat urodynamics at an appropriate interval, dependent on clinical scenario, following treatment. Patients with lower urinary tract reconstruction involving bowel segments should have at least an annual history and physical, basic metabolic panel, and imaging. For patients with larger portions of small bowel harvested, vitamin B12 monitoring should also commence within five years following surgery due to irreversible adverse effects resulting from vitamin deficiency and ease of supplementation if needed. Bacteriuria Surveillance and Infection Management The Neurogenic Lower Urinary Tract Dysfunction Guidelines include extensive discussion of the management of bacteriuria and urinary tract infection. Notably, the panel recommends against the use of routine urine testing or culture in asymptomatic patients. These recommendations are based on observational studies showing that although rates of bacterial colonization are high, only a minority of colonized patients will develop symptomatic urinary tract infection. Further, in 2019, the Infectious Diseases Society of America recommended against screening asymptomatic patients with spinal cord injury or indwelling catheters. Similarly, treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria in patients with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction is not recommended. Treatment is associated with the development of resistant organisms and does not reduce the rate of future infections in patients on clean intermittent catheterization. A key exception is prior to urologic procedures with upper tract manipulation or urothelial disruption. In these scenarios, treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria is indicated. Diagnosing a true symptomatic urinary tract infection in the neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patient population can be difficult, and the signs and symptoms will vary based on the neurologic deficit. Clinicians should be vigilant for fever, new or worsening incontinence, leakage around indwelling catheters, constitutional symptoms cloudy or malodorous urine, or worsening autonomic dysreflexia. No symptom alone is enough to conclusively diagnose urinary tract infection, and the entire clinical picture, including urinalysis and urine culture, must be considered. One study has shown pyuria to have the greatest sensitivity, 83%, for urinary tract infection in patients with spinal cord injury, while fever and autonomic dysreflexia had the highest specificity, 99%, but low sensitivity. A similar retrospective study in spinal cord injury patients found malodorous urine to be the most sensitive indicator of urinary tract infection and new onset incontinence to be the most specific. Though in our opinion, relying solely on isolated change in urine odor in the absence of other symptoms to diagnose urinary tract infection will likely result in overtreatment due to merely a change in dominant colonizing organism. Conflicting findings like the ones mentioned underscore the difficulty in relying on a single symptom to diagnose urinary tract infection in this patient population, especially given the range of pathologies and symptomatology that comprise neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. In patients with indwelling catheters, the guidelines recommend applying the Infectious Diseases Society of America criteria for catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Symptoms, bacterial count greater than 10 to the third CFU, and no other source of infection choice of antimicrobial should be guided by urine culture results, and prior culture results should be reviewed before starting empiric treatment. The guidelines state as a clinical principle that if a neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patient with a febrile urinary tract infection does not respond to antibiotics, or if they are not up-to-date on upper tract surveillance, upper tract imaging should be obtained. Additionally, the panel recommended that in catheter-dependent neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients with a suspected urinary tract infection, the urine culture be collected after changing the catheter. Plugging the replaced catheter may be used to aid in the collection, but urine is not to be obtained from tubing or the collection bag. If patients are experiencing recurrent urinary tract infections, then evaluation with cystoscopy and imaging is suggested as a clinical principle. Urodynamics should be performed in patients with recurrent urinary tract infections and normal upper and lower tract evaluation, as there is evidence that insufficiently optimized bladder mechanics increase the risk of urinary tract infection. Lastly, 
the guidelines panel specifically recommends against the use of antibiotic prophylaxis in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients with indwelling catheters or who use clean intermittent catheterization who do not have recurrent urinary tract infection. The panel based this recommendation on evidence from a systematic review showing that antimicrobial prophylaxis did not decrease infection rates in catheter-dependent spinal cord injury patients and actually increased the risk of the development of resistant organisms. However, in patients who are clean intermittent catheterization dependent with recurrent urinary tract infections, antibiotic prophylaxis may be initiated after shared decision-making discussing the risks of resistant organisms. Conclusions Given the myriad of neurologic insults that can result in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, it is essential that the practicing urologist understand the basic workup and management guidelines discussed in this update. Many of the concepts discussed herein are covered in extensive detail in the unabridged guidelines. We recommend that any clinician who frequently encounters neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients review the complete document to aid in their management decisions. Did you know? To reduce urethral trauma in neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients unable to perform clean intermittent catheterization, a suprapubic indwelling catheter is preferred over an indwelling urethral catheter. In neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patients, prior to surgical treatment for stress urinary incontinence, artificial urinary sphincters, bladder neck closure, or sling, urodynamics must be performed to confirm safe storage pressures. If a neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction patient develops a febrile urinary tract infection not responsive to antibiotics, or if they are not up-to-date on upper tract surveillance, then upper tract imaging should be performed. If you've enjoyed this episode, would like to hear more episodes like this one, or are interested in the AUA update series, please visit the AUA University at auanet.org backslash university for more information or to purchase your subscription today.